So you might have had a spiritual awakening as someone with British or Irish heritage and feel that there isn't an easy path to go down. And this could be due to the lack of spiritual sacred history here other than Christianity, of course. And firstly, I need to say, it's not easy. Spirituality isn't easy because existence isn't easy. It's miraculously mystical and many spiritual pursuits are devotional and take time. But no matter where you are from in the world, you can connect to Earth, of course, because her seasons, cycles and spirits have not changed. So you can look back at your ancestors from thousands of years ago, pre-Christianity, and still practice the indigenous ways of living that they did, because the natural cycles are still here to connect to. And to many people, this might be called paganism, but in reality, it is animism. More on that later. I'm Stella and I'm Welsh and my spiritual awakening was due to meeting the fantastic fungi, the psychedelic mushrooms of the British lands, in which my next video is going to be all about that because I believe it's integral to understanding ancient spiritual history here. But this awakening catapulted me into this like online new age spiritual world because the colonization of my ancestors thousands of years ago led to my people then going and colonizing the rest of the world and completely forgetting what it is like to live in harmony with the land here. We're so utterly disconnected, it took me literally seven years to find some sort of root and ground myself into the sacredness of this space, what we now know as Britain and Ireland. But I will say thank God for Eastern traditions such as Taoism, Hinduism and Buddhism because aspects of these are universal, anyone can access them. But I was beginning to ask where do I belong? What are the indigenous practices of ancient Britain? How can I reconnect to them and how can I feel more purpose in connecting to the earth around me and more importantly why haven't I done this already so firstly let's talk about why so what we now know as Britain was once known as Pratani or the painted ones from outsiders but just like in the Americas or anywhere else in the world, there would have been different tribes that had different ways of living with the land, different spiritual beliefs, different practices, traditions, languages, entire different cultures. And even today, if you look at Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, um, Isle of Man, Devon, Cornwall, Wales, they still have their native cultures that are very, very different. But to a lot of people around the world, they just kind of see us as the UK and think like we're just one culture, but we're not, like we're vastly different. And the reason that people on the outside see us like this is because our history is very, very messy. People don't understand that Wales or Britain was the first to be colonised by the big colonisers of the world that we know today. The corruption started here. And while we are responsible for decolonizing our minds, we also need to grieve what we have lost, which is where I'm coming into this. So Devon and Cornwall, for example, are now classed as England, but they both had very different cultures in the past and they still do. But just like Wales, we have lost so much and our traditions were not written down. Like our sacred leaders, our spiritual leaders would train for years. I'll go into this more in a bit, but they would train for like up to 20 years in memory, reciting, using words to gather their not spiritual knowledge and wisdom in order to integrate it and practice it. And I often get asked, why isn't England on your list of indigenous cultures in Britain? And this is because England isn't an indigenous animistic culture. It's a kingdom built on the back of a colonized people who are my ancestors and unfortunately the land where England is now invaders came in through what we now know as England and pushed the indigenous peoples of Britain out towards the outer edges which is where we've got Wales now like so England technically isn't an indigenous culture because if the people of those indigenous cultures of the land before had been pushed to the side do you see what I'm saying and I will say disclaimer I'm not a historian I am a content creator. Okay, moving on. There is one unifying aspect of all of the tribes across ancient Britain, and that is what we today call animism. So what is animism? Animism, we can look at the word and the etymology of it to animate. It is looking at the earth, whether you're looking at a rock, 
a squirrel or a tree and believe in that it is animate of life and spirit. It is kind of like the base layer of indigenous beliefs. And the reason that I go beliefs is because it is not something that needs to have faith. It is naturally occurring within all indigenous cultures and people who are close to nature that all of nature needs to be honored and respected because if we don't honor nature, it will eat us alive. So now onto how to connect. What can you do as someone perhaps from these lands or someone who has got ancestors from these lands. Perhaps you're in America and your family left here to colonize the Americas, you know. I have actually spoken to people who have a Native American grandparent and a Welsh grandparent and they talk about how similar the history is in terms of what they went through as children. So there are shared traumas between like my ancestors and their ancestors which is never really spoken about, people are usually quite shocked. Like for example, my Nana's parents, like my Nana remembers her mum talking about being beaten as a child for speaking our language. This was like only a hundred years ago. People can remember this. So yeah, now onto how to connect, like what can we do? So this is endless and ever so personal. The first thing I will say that I did, that I, th I felt was important for me, was look at the history. Now this isn't quite a spiritual pursuit, more so an academic study, <laughs> um, but it involves looking at the spiritual leaders of the ancient British world, who we know today as the Druids basically wizards that Hollywood today is culturally appropriating. So when you think about spells, cloaks, magic, staffs, wands, rituals under moonlight, this is what the people did, this is what they were doing. It isn't some made up fantasy, it was a reality and it is unfair to create a fantasy out of it in my opinion because it was very real to the people of my past. So these druids were known as the seers who lived in harmony with nature. We don't have a lot of information about them because as I said, they were an oral culture. So they didn't write things down. Everything was very much through word and sound, spells, magic, all of that mystically magical stuff. And a part of looking at the spiritual history here, we can look towards folklore, mythology, and stories. And the reason it's important to look at these are because they reflect the culture of the time and they are kind of like a gateway into understanding the minds of the people and especially when you've got stories about the natural world where the natural world today isn't any different we can use these stories to influence our lives and remind us on of how to honor and respect her and within these stories we get creatures and fairies there was a whole fairy faith in britain um, there are fairy faiths all over the world and they are still here, they are still alive, they haven't gone anywhere, they're just quiet and probably freaking scared. And then we can look towards gods and goddesses. So in Wales, we didn't have gods and goddesses that we worshipped, but today in modern Druidry and neo-paganism, I often find people around the world who are misinformed say that we did have goddesses and gods, such as Ceredwen, um, but she was simply a character from a story that had more than human abilities. She was a magical witch, and I will go more into her story and things like that in other videos. Secondly, what you can do is the animistic approach, which is following the seasons, following the spirit of the seasons, being in ceremony, having tradition and ritual as a way to um, literally be a part of and live with the land itself. So this is like connecting to your bioregion, like noticing like what plants come up at what time. Can you eat them? If you can eat them, are they medicinal? Are you going to save money um, from not going to the shop by going and getting wild garlic? And is that going to be far healthier for you than the garlic in the shop? Yes, things like this are wonderful spiritual ways to connect to the land around you. Obviously, this is for people who are already in Britain, um, who are on these lands already. But if you're in the Americas and you want to connect animistically to the land around you, you can still do this obviously you're just not connecting to your heritage but you are playing a role in um, re-indigenizing yourself to the land around you which is what my life's about right now <laughs> and then thirdly sacred sites so 
All over the world, we've got structures made by man that were used for ceremony and ritual as a way to connect with and harness the energies of the natural world. Whether this is looking at the stone circles that are placed um, specifically in a way, they are arranged in a way that they l almost look as if they are like energy centers for when the equinoxes and the solstices happen because these are pivotal points in the Earth's cycles where transformation happens that, that, that affects us too. So our ancestors would quite literally perform ceremony and the word ceremony comes from the word cereal so we would celebrate the food and honour the fact that we're being given life from Earth. Now today it might seem like we don't have to do that because we get food in the shops but that is where the issue of destroying the earth comes in because we're not connecting the dots on how the food and life force energy is being put into our body like where it's coming from but for a ceremony and ritual and creating traditions um, in our friendship groups and communities and families we can start to practice the exact same things that our ancestors practiced because as I said the seasons haven't changed, nature hasn't changed, we still have to eat, the food still comes from the ground, the animals still have to be slaughtered. These things are sacrifices and need to be respected. And then in terms of the temples or like churches of the ancient druids, they were natural spaces in themselves. So groves of trees, circles of trees. Uh, where the druids would be trained. And when we start to look at the history of these structures, these sacred sites, we find water. And water is massive in Celtic spirituality. We would honour and protect sacred springs because obviously springs come from water deep, deep within the earth over the process of thousands and thousands of years. Um, and they come up and feed life to the land and feed life to us. We would honour and protect these spaces. And then over time, Christianity built churches upon these springs and turned them into holy wells. So these are still spaces to visit, to um, revere the, the spirit of water and revere the life-giving properties of the sacred waters. And in doing so, by like looking by either researching and studying these spaces and understanding their history or actually going there and performing ceremony, performing ritual, giving offering is a way to form a deep, deep, beautiful relationship with the natural world. I do it and you can also collect the water at a lot of these springs that are still protected or you can take a bottle that can fill to the water. So now, there is so much more to this. I'm a little bit out of breath. I'm massively passionate about this. If you've seen me on Instagram, I've been sharing like short three to seven second reels, bringing up these triggering conversations because I think it's absolutely necessary. Like at the end of the day, there is so much to explore. And I am just here to tell you that this is your invitation to go and dive deep into it because it is so easy to culturally appropriate other cultures as people who are so far removed from our own spiritual cultures. Um, there's no point in feeling guilt um, around this and we can all make mistakes. For example, I used to buy white sage and burn it and smudge it. I didn't know that that one was a closed practice from indigenous cultures that I have no connection to. And two, I didn't realize that white sage is literally an endangered plant species. Three, I didn't realize that my granddad grows sage in his garden. We have British sage and now I use that. So yeah, my next video is gonna be on how Britain and Ireland have some of the strongest psychedelic mushrooms in the whole of the world. And perhaps this can tell us something about our sacred spiritual history, especially when it comes to pixies, fairies, and goblins. See you in the next video, guys. Awan, awan, awan.